We were as good as our word, for it was just seven when we reached the copper beaches, having put up our trap at a wayside public house. The group of trees, with their dark leaves shining like burnished metal in the light of the setting sun, was sufficient to mark the house, even had Miss Hunter not been standing, smiling on the doorstep. Have you managed it? asked Holmes. A loud thudding noise came from somewhere downstairs. That is Mrs. Toller in the cellar, said she. Her husband lies snoring on the kitchen rug. Here are his keys, which are the duplicates of Mr. Rucastle's. You have done well indeed, cried Holmes with enthusiasm. Now lead the way and we shall soon see the end of this black business. We passed up the stair, unlocked the door, followed on down a passage, and found ourselves in front of the barricade which Miss Hunter had described. Holmes cut the cord and removed the transverse bar. Then he tried the various keys in the lock, but without success. No sound came from within, and at the silence, Holmes's face clouded over. I trust that we are not too late, said he. I think, Miss Hunter, that we had better go in without you. Now, Watson, put your shoulder to it, and we shall see whether we cannot make our way in. It was an old rickety door, and gave at once before our united strength. Together we rushed into the room. It was empty. There was no furniture save a little pallet bed, a small table, and a basket full of linen. The skylight above was open, and the prisoner gone. There has been some villainy here, said Holmes. This beauty has guessed Miss Hunter's intentions and has carried his victim off. But how? Through the skylight. We shall soon see how he managed it. He swung himself up onto the roof. Ah, yes, he cried. Here's the end of a long light ladder against the eaves. This is how he did it. But it is impossible, said Miss Hunter. The ladder was not there when the Rucastles went away. He has come back and done it. I tell you that he is a clever and dangerous man. I should not be very much surprised if this were he whose step I hear now upon the stair. I think, Watson, that it would be as well for you to have your pistol ready. The words were hardly out of his mouth before a man appeared at the door of the room. A very fat and burly man with a heavy stick in his hand. Miss Hunter screamed and shrunk against the wall at the sight of him, but Sherlock Holmes sprang forward and confronted him. You villain, said he, where's your daughter? The fat man cast his eyes round and then up at the open skylight. It is for me to ask you that, he shrieked. You thieves, spies and thieves, I've caught you, have I? You are in my power, I'll serve you. He turned and clattered down the stairs as hard as he could go. He's gone for the dog, cried Miss Hunter. I have my revolver, said I. Better close the front door, cried Holmes, and we all rushed down the stairs together. We had hardly reached the hall when we heard the baying of a hound, and then a scream of agony with a horrible worrying sound which it was dreadful to listen to. An elderly man with a red face and shaking limbs came staggering out at a side door. My God, he cried, someone has loosed the dog. It's not been fed for two days. Quick, quick, or it'll be too late. Holmes and I rushed out and round the angle of the house, with Toller hurrying behind us. There was the huge, famished brute, its black muzzle buried in Rucastle's throat, while he writhed and screamed upon the ground. Running up, I blew its brains out and it fell over with its keen white teeth still meeting in the great creases of his neck. With much labor, we separated them and carried him, living but horribly mangled, into the house. We laid him upon the drawing-room sofa, and having dispatched the sobered toller to bear the news to his wife, I did what I could to relieve his pain. We were all assembled round him when the door opened, and a tall, gaunt woman entered the room. Mrs. Toller, cried Miss Hunter. Yes, miss. Mr. Rucastle let me out when he came back before he went up to you. Ah, miss, it is a pity you didn't let me know what you were planning, for I would have told you that your pains were wasted. Ha, said Holmes, looking keenly at her. It is clear that Mrs. Toller knows more about this matter than anyone else. 
Yes, sir, I do, and I am ready enough to tell what I know. Then pray sit down and let us hear it, for there are several points on which I must confess that I am still in the dark. I will soon make it clear to you, said she, and I'd have done so before now if I could have got out from the cellar. If there's police court business over this, you'll remember that I was the one that stood your friend, and that I was Miss Alice's friend, too. She was never happy at home, Miss Alice wasn't, from the time that her father married again. She was slighted like and had no say in anything. But it never really became bad for her until after she met Mr. Fowler at a friend's house. As well as I could learn, Miss Alice had rights of her own by will, but she was so quiet and patient, she was, that she never said a word about them, but just left everything in Mr. Rucastle's hands. He knew he was safe with her, but when there was a chance of a husband coming forward who would ask for all that the law would give him, then her father thought it time to put a stop on it. He wanted her to sign a paper so that whether she married or not, he could use her money. When she wouldn't do it, he kept on worrying her until she got brain fever and for six weeks was at death's door. Then she got better at last, all worn to a shadow and with her beautiful hair cut off but that didn't make no change in a young man, and he stuck to her as true as man could be. Ah, said Holmes, I think that what you have been good enough to tell us makes the matter fairly clear, and that I can deduce all that remains. Mr. Rucastle then, I presume, took to this system of imprisonment? Yes, sir. And brought Miss Hunter down from London in order to get rid of the disagreeable persistence of Mr. Fowler. That was it, sir. But Mr. Fowler being a persevering man as a good seaman should be, blockaded the house, and having met you, succeeded by certain arguments, metallic or otherwise, in convincing you that your interests were the same as his. Mr. Fowler was a very kind-spoken, free-handed gentleman, said Mrs. Toller serenely, and in this way he managed that your good man should have no want of drink, and that a ladder should be ready at the moment when your master had gone out, you have it, sir, just as it happened. I am sure we owe you an apology, Mrs. Toller, said Holmes, for you have certainly cleared up everything which puzzled us. And here comes the country surgeon and Mrs. Rucastle, so I think, Watson, that we had best escort Miss Hunter back to Winchester, as it seems to me that our locus standi now is rather a questionable one. And thus was solved the mystery of the sinister house with the copper beeches in front of the door. Mr. Rucastle survived, but was always a broken man, kept alive solely through the care of his devoted wife. They still live with their old servants, who probably know so much of Rucastle's past life that he finds it difficult to part from them. Mr. Fowler and Miss Rucastle were married by special license in Southampton the day after their flight, and he is now the holder of a government appointment in the island of Mauritius. As to Miss Violet Hunter, my friend Holmes, rather to my disappointment, manifested no further interest in her when once she had ceased to be the centre of one of his problems, and she is now the head of a private school at Walsall, where I believe that she has met with considerable success.